Hi folks, it's Andy. Welcome to this week's Kendo Rant. I've got two full pages of questions. We've got loads to get through, so we're going to really have a quick fire round today. But before we do that, don't forget, like, share, subscribe, all that sort of thing. Join the Kendo Show Early Access Group. There's a link in the description and do your shopping at Kendo Star. That's what pays for all this to happen. Right, next one. First one. <laughs> Hello, I have another question uh, that I hesitate to post in the comments of your message because I might get identified. So this is an anonymous question. Um, this was sent to me by private message. Um, what is one supposed to do if the sensei running the practice is employing some rather physical feedback techniques during Uchikomi practice to signal the kakarite uh, that is too, he or she is too slow? For example, hitting from behind. Um, how does one that still wants to practice uh, attend this kind of practice because of the rest of the drills refuse to participate in that particular drill? So um, you're going to practice, you do Uchikomi, and when you do so, the sensei thinks you're not going through fast enough so they sort of hit you or like sometimes they kind of hit men like this on the back and stuff like that. Usually they don't like go smash like that. It's not, you know, but it, it's not super pleasant. I mean, it's to encourage you to go faster. And it's quite a traditional way of teaching. Something I've experienced an awful lot. <laughs> um, and the question is, how do you not, uh, how do you, uh, it literally says, um, how do you refuse to participate in that aspect but practice the rest of the practice still anyway. Uh, you can't do that, I'm afraid. Um, you can either go and attend that practice in full or you can go and practice somewhere else. You can't just turn up and pick and choose the bits that you want to do. That's not really fair. Um, not on the teachers, not on the other people that are doing it. Um, and it's not good for you either. If I'm honest with you, look, this is going to be a bit controversial. I'm sure somebody's going to go in the comments there and be like, oh, Andy's wrong one about that. But fine, you can say that all you want. Um, I just suck it up, get in there um, and do it because that's the way Kendo has been taught for decades and decades. And that's how really strong people become really strong. Um, so go and go and do it. Um, face it for what it is. Uh, and I'm sure you'll come out stronger the other side. Next one. Uh, what are your thoughts on the men nadi? Uh, do you think it's something useful for beginners or detrimental? Uh, even a little gimmicky to be of any use. Thanks uh, so much. I love your show. Thank you very much. So the men nadi is this uh, stick that when you swing it, it's got a little thing inside that shoots to the end and makes a noise. Uh, the premise is, is that when you do subudi pr properly, it's supposed to make the thing move and make the noise. And if you don't do subudi properly, it doesn't. Right, I've tried one. I've got, I, I, I have actually got them available um, to me in my network of suppliers if I wanted to sell them. I don't sell them because I think they're a total piece of junk. They are a total uh, piece of a gimmick. Uh, it's, it's basically like, it reminds me of one of those golf swing trainers. Um, I don't play golf, so I don't know much about that. But look, I've had a go of one. It's total rubbish for Kendall. Uh, yes. You can, you, you can swing it up and swing it down and make it make the noise. You can also swing it wrong and it will still make the noise. Uh, you have to reset it every time. I think it forms a bad habit because you can't do Renzoku Saburi with it. You have to do one, do one cut and then you have to tilt the thing up vertically instead of cutting and remaining in Chudan. It's rubbish. Don't waste your time or money with it. Um, and if you've already bought one, put it on eBay. Uh, next, <laughs> uh, about two years ago, I bought a uh, Mikatsuki uh, Soma Borger. Um, I've had two kids and uh, a scary bike crash, uh, bike crash since then. Uh, and now I started Kendo again. Right, so first off, before I get into your question, um, Mikatsuki Bodogu is a, a previous, basically Mikatsuki Bodogu is uh, one of the partners that we work with uh, at Kendo Star. Um, we've got a shop over in Japan in Saga. The shop itself is called Mikatsuki Bodoga. Uh, and we had a website before it all came together as Kendo Star called Mikatsuki Bodoga. And one of the Borga sets we sold there was called Soma. So that's the one that he's talking about. I know the Borga very well. Um, you've had two kids. Congratulations. Amazing. Um, and I'm really glad to hear that you're back at Kendo after the bike crash. Um, so I've not used it very much, maybe about 10 sessions. So it's almost new. The problem is after training, I get a good swell on the Kote forearm. Uh, it doesn't turn blue, but it's a bit uncomfortable. Uh, is it a fitting problem with the Kote, a posture problem when receiving Kote, or just a thing to get older, over and part of Kendo uh, as I, can, I could live with it? Um, or is the style of Kote uh, that it is just too thin, thin? So, right. So the question is, is after using it, um, you've only used it about 10 times and you, you're feeling a bit of pain on the forearm after receiving kote. Right, um, first off, it's not a problem with the fitting of the kote, right? 
Um, I'm just, I, I don't think it's that at all. I don't think it's that they're called their tooth thin either because the Soma was pretty, pretty protective actually. Um, there's two things. A little bit of it is that you do need to kind of get used to being hit on the Kode. Uh, it does hurt quite a lot when you're not used to it so much and it does go away uh, once you're used to it. However, it's probably also to do with the other people that are hitting. You might need to look at that, maybe even talk to your teacher because they shouldn't be belting you so hard that it stings for day afterward, days afterwards and bruising you. Um, Kode, and this is for everybody watching, if you're hitting someone's kode, you're not supposed to hit it hard. You're supposed to hit it accurately and sharply. Pam, like this, not boom, like that, all right? Um, so if you're doing kendo in your dojo, think about that. Don't, you're not supposed to smack kote as hard as you can. You're not even su supposed to hit it that hard, all right? You're just supposed to hit it accurately with the right bit of the shinai. Same with do, uh, and same with all the waza, actually. Um, but particularly kote, you don't need to belt it as hard as you can. So just check yourself when you're doing that. Uh, I don't mean that to the person who asked the question, uh, but just to everyone in general, frankly. Uh, but yeah, I don't think it's the boga. Um, I certainly don't think so. The so soma was a pretty protective one. Um, I think, yeah, like I say, it's probably more to do with uh, you getting used to it a bit and, like I say, uh, probably the technique of some of the people that you're receiving from. Uh, next one, I recently saw on your rant, uh, your rant the eternal IQ question. Uh, in my country, there are a few practitioners and poli uh, political struggle in Kendall that make it very difficult to take exams for any grade. Uh, I've been practicing for seven years and I've not got a chance to take any example, uh, examination, just an example. Uh, since there's a uh, political issue, it's also hard to get a letter to get an exam outside the country. What's your advice in this kind of case? How can I surpass my level with no goal or guide, even to be earned by a, a belt, if that makes any sense? So, right. I followed this up a little bit to get a little bit more information. Um, this is a really difficult situation, if I'm honest with you. Um, there's obviously a political issue in the country with the, it sounds like there's not many people there. And even so, the people that are doing Kindle there have sort of fallen out. I think he even said that the his teacher has split from the association. And because of that, his dojo is no longer part of that association, which means that, that I'm talking about the official association, which means that uh, the students of that club, they can't participate, of course, in gradings because, um, they're not affiliated to the, the federation. I mean, there's not a lot of ways around that, unfortunately, other than you've got to try and you've got to try and cross the bridge somehow. Do you know what I mean? You've got to try and cross that bridge somehow by uh, if it was me, I'd be trying to build bridges with the other dojo and, you know, and try. Uh, unfortunately, this sort of political thing happens quite a lot. I've even I've got experience of it myself, um, not personally, uh, because I don't I don't get involved in that sort of uh, kendo politics at all I'm not interested in it but I've been in the case where people in my club have had that and it's affected the club a bit um, but look you just have to I, I think the best thing for you is to try and put that to one side try and reach out to the other dojo or maybe even see if you can build bridges some way so that you can get things back on back on track because there's no that it ain't going to help your dojo right I know I know your sensei has obviously broken you away from the uh, federation and I'm sure he's a fantastic sensei but he ain't going to be helping the club as a whole by being separate from the International Kendo Federation and the international community so you need to try if it, if it was me I'd be looking at trying to figure out how we can get that back together um, especially as you've been doing Kendo for seven years now it's not like you're only just starting so you must have some sort of influence in your club as well especially in a place where there's not so many people doing Kendo all right uh, I think that's the only hope you've got at the time uh, for the time being Next one, I had a question, maybe uh, for another one of your videos. Uh, what do you think of the spinning zanshin for door? The one where you see typically at university level shi'ai where the guy seems to use the momentum of the twist of his hips to spin and regain eye contact with the opponent. Seems to me like a very effective type of zanshin for door uh, as you regain high contact, quite, uh, eye contact quite fast uh, and you use the momentum to create and help you do zanshin. So what you're talking about is after you do door, particularly kaishi door, instead of hitting this way, going past and turning this way, in, instead you use the, the momentum to hit this way and spin all the way around like that, like a ballerina, and uh, go back and face them. Then you can tell by the way I described that, that I don't really approve of it. <laughs> um, I don't think it's good to do it. Um, sometimes it is, it, it, it's not like you must never do it and it's never fun if you do that. It's not that th sort of thing. Um, it's better not to do it, 
All right, it's better not to do it. It's better to hit door. You shouldn't be hitting door sideways like this, this way anyway. You should be hitting door forwards this way. So you shouldn't be spinning this way, yeah? If that's what happens to you, your technique's a bit wrong, all right? And that's why these young kids, especially high school, university kids, they haven't quite got that technique down yet. And that is something that, you know, they move very quickly. And that's why you see it a lot in their shi. Again, doesn't mean that you cross out the ippon and say, oh, now you span around so it's no ippon. That, it doesn't, <laughs> you know, that's, that's not the way to judge it. But the correct way, the best way, you do the door properly. You don't need to spin around this way, you're hitting this way, forward, that way, like bam, this way, then you turn, keep them in your eye contact as much as possible, and that's the best way to do it. Uh, next one, uh, my question is, I can't do Cesar because I had an accident before, uh, and I broke my left tibial plateau, I don't know what that is, but I guess it's something in your leg, uh, <laughs> I can't flex my uh, left knee fully, uh, I know that when don donning the burger, you should be in Cesar, are there any other ways to wear the burger except in Cesar? Yeah, look, that's the ideal way. In general, you should sit in Cesar when, you, when you're, uh, well, there's times in Kendall when you should sit in Cesar, when you do day, when you put on the ball and stuff like that. But it, it's like a general rule. If you can't do it, you can't do it, right? So yeah, if you have to sit, uh, sit differently or if you have to kneel or, or if you have to stand up even to do it, it's okay, yeah? If you can do Cesar, then you shouldn't stand up and put on your burger. <laughs> Yeah, but what it doesn't mean is that if you can't do Cesar, don't put on your burger. It doesn't mean that, right? There's somebody else commented on this about some of the, you know, elderly senseis. You know, they get to a point where they can't do that anymore. And um, sometimes they have to sit in a chair while they put it on or something like that. There's ways around it. Yeah, you don't, it, it, it's not like, oh, you can't do Cesar, so that's it for you now. You know, you don't have to look at it that way. It's not that, um, you know, definite. Yeah, you can still... Um, you can still participate, absolutely, absolutely, just with a bit of an imagination and, and keep him respectful, you know? Uh, right, this is an interesting one. It says, uh, I was looking at an article the other day. The article is about engaging the hips mostly, but I got to wondering about angles of the hips and shoulders and how it may, may vary. Uh, my own chudan is somewhat similar to the image in the article, my left hip and shoulder angled back a little from the right. Uh, and my left hand sitting pretty much in the center. I'll put the image you're talking about up like here, right now. Um, <laughs> uh, I've also seen once or twice and heard about a kamai where the left hand is off center towards the left hip a bit more, and the kensen in the center making the shinai sit at an angle rather than a straight, uh, straight center, uh, if that makes any sense. How much variance in these aspects have you seen in the many kendoko that you've come across? Does varying body types create a tendency to adopt certain body positions? Do you feel that there's optimal body position, especially in regards to hip and shoulder angle? Okay, so I know the I know the diagram you're talking about. I know the angle, uh, the article that you're talking about as well. Um, and yet, yeah, look, right, this is going to be an awkward one. <laughs> I'm not really at a level yet where I think I'm really... Uh, ready to start really experimenting too much with the shape of my kamae, deviating from what is taught as orthodox uh, kamae. But in my opinion, right, your hips should be as much, your toes should be straight forward, parallel, straight line, this way. And in turn, your hips should pretty much be the same. This is my opinion, right? This might be different to this diagram I'm talking about or whatever you've seen in the article. But this is what I think. Yeah, <clears throat> I think that the left hand and the shinai should be in the middle of the body right in the middle of the body uh, and straight yeah my left shoulder when I do this position in order to get the right wrist position and now this diagram that I was talking about up here it's really about it's not so much about the hip position it's about the shoulder position and how to get the right uh, wrist position when you hold the shinai with your left hand because if you have your shoulders dead straight when you hold the shinai you often end up with this wrist position. I'm having to stand on my tiptoes so I can get on the camera because I'm only short. Yeah, but <laughs> you end up having this sort of wrist position when it should be more of this sort of position like that. So if I stand in my kamae, if I stand side on like this, you'll see my left sh shoulder is slightly behind my right shoulder. And that's so that I can get the right position in my left hand. And you can see that on the diagram that I should be having on the screen right now. All right. Um, <clears throat> but for the time being, I think you should keep your hips as straight as you can. Um, and try and make that shape with your wrists, yeah, um, as per the diagram, uh, like that. That's what I think, all right? About, um, 
you know, talking about people having different kamai where the left left hand is off center. I've heard people that hold it with their the knuckle of their thumb on the center as opposed to the uh, uh, the shinai with the shinai slightly diagonal this way. <coughs> all the people I've seen that do that kind of kamai on are, are nanadan or above. All right. Um, all the people I've seen that experiment or have developed their own style of kamai tend to be seventh, eighth dan uh, or above. Yeah. So. Um, for me, that's like above my pay grade right now. Uh, I don't think that that's something that I'm ready to start delving into in my own Kendall um, because I'm I'm just not at that stage of, of having done enough Kihon yet, if that makes sense. And I don't think it's necessarily related to body type. Of course, your body type affects how, how your proportions are and how you can hold the shinai and stuff. But in general, the principle, I think, remains the same throughout. Uh, right, what about on the basic fo footstep? Uh, push with the left th legs, uh, thighs versus push with the calf and ankle. I got some pain in my Achilles heel and it gets better when I stop to push too much with the foot instead of the legs. Thanks for all your good tips. I'm enjoying my new Vanguard Cote. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so when you push off from your left leg with what's called humikiri, that's the pushing action, the kicking off, the launching action, right? It's, it's from your left calf. Right, it's from your left calf. It's not from your left thigh. Your left thigh is pretty much relaxed. Yeah, uh, I know you can't see my feet on this, but if you go and watch the Ash Sabaki video that I just put up for Kendo Zero to Shodan, definitely go and watch that. You have your tension. Your power comes from your left calf. All right, and your your calf and your sudden kamae is pushing down and diagonally back this way. Right, if I stand <coughs> side on and kamae again, my calf is pushing power this way, downwards, straight into the floor, all right? And my left heel is raised, my knee is slightly bent, right? Not locked straight, but slightly bent so that I can push myself forward this way, all right? Forward this way, all right? <coughs> it has to come from your calf, right? That means that you have to uh, develop uh, flexibility and um, strength in both your calves and your Achilles tendon. All right, that's why the Achilles tendon uh, injury is so common in Kendall. Yeah, because it is something that we put a lot of strain on. Uh, next one. Um, <clears throat> we know Kendo is great for kids as it shows in Japan. So why are we neglecting children in the UK from the same benefits? Uh, <laughs> I love this question. Uh, in our current climate, respect and discipline is hard to come by. Do you think the BKA should be a, should be using the same model as other sporting federations, like investing more on school holiday introduction courses and make it easy to access? So, um, <clears throat> I definitely think for the second part of your question, whether it's the BK, that's the British Kendo Association, or any other federation, um, yes, I definitely think it's a good thing to get uh, involved as much as possible as other like, like other sports do uh, with kids, you know, like a, a summer holiday camp or something like that. Anything like that, I think that could be awesome. Uh, whether that comes from a federation, it doesn't necessarily have to come from a federation. Like a dojo could organize that, right? Um, but here's the thing you're going to get, right, is that, um, yeah, Kendo, I think, is a great thing for kids. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of neglecting children in the UK from the same benefits, look, British kids or, well, kids outside of Japan, maybe we should say, um, they don't see Kendo in the same way as Japanese kids do in general. They don't know what Kendo is before they get involved with it. And the parents also don't see it in the same way. All right. It's very, very, very different um, in terms of uh, the approach, the mental approach to Kendo uh, with non-Japanese kids and Japanese kids. And even in Japan now, it's becoming more westernized. Uh, so more and more dojos are actually struggling uh, to keep Kendo alive uh, with the young kids because when they want to quit, because Kendo's not hard, it's not supposed to be like fun and games and stuff like that. They're not supposed to go there and enjoy it. They're supposed to go there for an education. Um, that's the idea as, as it's applied in Japan. So it's hard, it's tough, they get shouted at, they're expected to do things properly, they're expected to act with, with respect, uh, and they're expected to do their very best. And if they don't do that, they get in trouble and they're expected to respect their sensei. Um, but these days, even in Japan, Lots of kids, you know, when they say, oh, I don't want to do it, I want to quit. The parents often take them out and stop them doing that. So I think there's a problem in Japan as well, perpetuating kendo, especially with kids because of that problem. And it's definitely something that I think is a big barrier with bringing kendo to like Europe or to other 
uh, countries, uh, children. Okay, next one. Uh, what is the correct etiquette to receive something handed to you by a sensei, such as a medal, trophy, or menjo? Okay, so yeah, this, that, that's a really great question, something we don't think about much. The correct et etiquette is to stand in front of them. Usually, um, they will be holding it like this. Uh, you could bow like this way, and normally they will be holding it this way. Often, if it's a certificate or something, they might read it out, uh, and they would sort of present it to you this way while sort of bowing, and you would receive it by bowing bowing as you receive it with both hands okay both hands here and you take it this way all right you don't just like he passes it to you you don't just go like thank you mate cheers yeah don't do that <laughs> all right uh, if it's like a trophy or something again you would take it with both hands as you bow at the same time bow at the same time take it this way ayatozaimashita like this and then turn and then you walk away something like that okay uh, <clears throat> next one, uh, do you recommend video or do you have uh, tips for Kendall training with a six-year-old girl in an adult atmosphere? She loves it and I, tra I train her at the moment, uh, but I'm welcome to good ideas. <laughs> You're asking the wrong person here, mate. <laughs> um, I uh, have this issue as well with my own kids um, because uh, where we live, there aren't other kids' dojos or any other kids doing Kendall. They're just my two uh, and then they do Kendall with adults. Um, it is very difficult uh, because they do need to train with other kids as well, really. Um, but if you can't, you can't, all right? So I think the best thing to do is just keep focusing on teaching her Kendall properly. Um, make sure that she's doing the basic things right. Of course, at six years old, that's still very young. Um, but the basic things, the manners, correct bowing, correct uh, holding the shinai, correct kamai, correct ash sabaki. That's enough, all right, uh, for the time being. Um, and then as she gets older um, and gets a little bit bigger, it'll be a bit easier for her to integrate with the, um, with the rest of the group, even if they are adults. You also need to talk to the adults as well. If you're training with kids, and this goes for anyone that's watching as well, if you're training with kids, you don't hit them the same way as you do other adults. I mean, I already said earlier in the video, you don't smash kote like, you know, like like the hammer of Thor or something. Smash, like that. you don't do that. Especially when you're practicing with kids, you just have to touch the bulger for the time being, all right? You don't have to bam like that um, because it, they're, they're little and it's going to hurt them. <laughs> okay? Um... Next one, Handy, what's your opinion about grey mengane on the inside uh, for better vision? All right, so um, I, I've tried that. You know, when the most, basically, the mengane, that's the, uh, the cage on the men, that's painted red for the most part. And that, that dates back to the traditions of the samurai, where the menpo, the part of the, um, the yoroi, the samurai armor, <clears throat> was often painted red on the inside. It's not red, actually. It's, it's a color called shiro. It's like a, a kind of vermilion color. It's like a kind of reddish very reddish slightly browny color uh, and the idea of that was that it was it would redden your complexion um when reflected the light you know it redden your uh complexion and make you look kind of uh scary uh to your opponent um and there's also sort of an idea that there is um some of us say that it was painted red on the mengane because it's easier to um red doesn't disturb your vision as much as other colors do um now look I've tried them with red. I, I normally use red. I think the uh, the concept of keeping the red as part of the tradition uh, of Japanese culture is quite important. And that's why Kendall Starborger generally all has red uh, on the inside. Uh, we can arrange it with grey if you really wanted it though. So you could get in touch. I have used the grey. If I'm honest with you, talking about looking out, whether it's easier to see or not, it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. If you can tell the difference between the colour of the inside of your men mengane, uh, you're not really concentrating on your kendo enough. So, uh, <laughs> um, frankly, the idea that the grey one or the black one or the blue one or the pink one or the green one would be easier to see out of is just rubbish, all right? Um, it, it, it's not, in my, in my experience anyway, in my experience, okay? Um, next one, every now and again, you hear people say that static stretching before exercise is either ineffective or actually counterproductive to prevent injury. However, in every dojo I've uh, been to, it starts a session with static stretching. And when I did the L1 coaching course, that's a coaching course in the UK, I think, uh, static stretching was recommended. 
uh, I'm not a doctor or a physio or anything like that. How can I know which information to trust? Uh, and this is off the back of another question that we got last week, but I didn't man manage it in time for the video. Uh, again, someone saying that they went to a, a different coaching course and they were told that stretching before practice was ineffective or possibly detrimental. <sighs> Look, I, I ain't the right person to answer this because I'm not a doctor. I'm not physio. I don't know. All right. I don't know if stretching beforehand is truly good or bad for you. Uh, the idea of it being detrimental, like not stretching before doing Keiko, um, that being a good idea is difficult for me to accept <laughs> because like for years everywhere stretches and warms up before practice and everyone seems pretty much okay <laughs> so uh, i'm going to continue doing it um it's up to you if you want to do the same maybe you should look into it a bit more if you're really worried about it uh it's been fine for me up to now uh, it's not that i've never been injured but i don't think it's because i did I, I stretched beforehand uh that i got injured i probably got injured because i didn't do it enough i don't know though um but i ain't gonna stand here and tell you do it or don't do it, right? Sorry, wrong wrong show. <laughs> Next one. Um, <laughs> uh, please give more insight into the differences between yakusoku, uchikomi, and kakari keiko. All right. Uh, yakusoku geiko. Yakusoku geiko. Yakusoku means promise. So yakusoku geiko is when um, you and your partner um, have a agreed pattern of waza. All right, so you agree with your um, your partner. Okay, we're gonna do five times men. That's the yakusoku geiko. Or we're gonna do you do men, and I'm gonna do kaishido. That's yakusoku geiko. Or uh, I'm gonna do uh, men kote men, men hiki men, men hiki do men like uchikomi. Uh, that's also yakusoku geiko. Any any keiko where you make a promise with your partner. Uh, as to what you're going to do, that's yakusoku geiko. And it doesn't mean you specifically have to talk to your partner and say, let's do this. The sensei could say, right, everybody, let's do four times men, renzoku. That's also yakusoku geiko, because that yakusoku, that promise, that, that decision has been made. All right, that's yakusoku geiko. Uchikomi geiko is where, um, right, uchikomi geiko, kari geiko, they, they, here's the problem, right, is that, we're straying into the territory now of uh, taking Japanese language and turn it into, turning it into terminology. And we had this discussion on the group a little while ago about some terms in a book that were like really like, um, you know, words that were really uncommon words for stuff that was normal. But anyway, um, so look, uchikomi geigo isn't a strict terminology, all right? Essentially, uchikomi is when you like, strike the other person so there's some places in japan that that call if you say to somebody right we're going to practice five times men and the other person's going to receive the men they call that uchikomi geiko right because you're striking the opponent the opponent however having said having said that before we muddy the water too much the zen kennen the all japan kennel federation basically their their stance on this is that Uchikomi is the kind of continuous striking from kakarite to openings that are obviously uh, presented by the uh, motodachi, all right? So in, in the broad sense, in the most common sense, uh, the motodachi will present openings. They will decide which openings. They will present openings for the kakarite and they will make uh, good-spirited, uh, correct yuko datotsu on those um those targets okay whether it's large waza or small waza if that's what's happening technically that's what the zen kennen refers to as uchikomi geiko kakari geiko is similar all right except um kakari geiko the motodachi does not provide those openings for the uh kakarite okay the kakarite has to uh make the uh, uh opportunities themselves they must attack um, with full spirit, with full stemi, without uh, regard as to whether they will be successful or not, whether they will receive the strikes or not, or whether they will be blocked or not. Uh, they must still try to strive, strive to make um, good uh, quality ippon over and over again as much as possible in the short time that they have to do it in full spirit. Okay, it's super hard. It's hardest practice there is. 
Okay, hi Andy, what's the difference uh, from the infamous Henkawaza to the better uh, I'm going to hit your men semi followed by Kote Strike? So I had to sort of clarify this a little bit uh, because Henkawaza is like, I, I never really, I, I didn't know what you meant by the term because that's a really broad term. It just means, it basically just means like strange technique. <laughs> so uh, you, you came back and said you, when when you faint and then hit. So I guess you're talking about when you like faint for men and then hit kote. Really popular waza, yeah? Men kote, men kote. Um, and what's uh, what's the difference between that and the better uh, I'm going to hit like semi towards men and then kote? Uh, there isn't a difference and it's not that they're one and uh, two separate things. They're two, uh, two things that work together, all right? Your feint to men and then strike kote is never going to work. Well, it might work if your opponent's not a very experienced person. But it's not going to work effectively, consistently, if you haven't applied semi towards the other person's men. If you haven't made them think that the men is in danger, the hands aren't going to come up for you when you apply that feint. Yeah? And it might not be a feint this way, all right, which is what you're talking about. Men kote. It might just be men kote, like that. Um... So it's, don't think of them too much as separate things, all right? It's not that they're two separate things. They're two things that work together hand in hand, all right? The most important thing is that you apply the semi. You put the pressure on. You make your opponent think, right, my men's under pressure. My men's under threat. My is under threat, whatever. And then you've got tools at your disposal as to how you can exploit that. You can either go straight for it. You can apply that feint. Or you could maybe stagger your timing somehow. You know, uh, there's different ways to do it. But don't separate them off too much. Last one. Uh, what's your favorite tenagree? <sighs> okay, here I am. I'm back. Um, <clears throat> okay, so it says, uh, what was my favorite tenagree? Uh, I've got loads of favorite tenagree. Loads. Um, but I've just picked out two that were to hand here at the office uh, that are particular favorites of mine. Um, this first one, uh, I really like a lot. Um, I don't know if it's ever holding that the right way. It says Chosen. It means challenge. Challenge. I love that one. I really like this one. I wear this one quite a lot. This one was given to me by Inoue Sensei from Kyoto. He's a Hanshi ninth dan. Yeah. After I did Keiko with him, totally beasted me. It was great. Um, but yeah, I love that Tenegri. I love the saying on it. Challenge. I think it's really, really great. Uh, and then the second one, this is one actually, this is one that I usually wear for uh, tournaments or for my last grading. I wore this one actually. Uh, I do like this one a lot. You can get it open. <clears throat> so uh, this one says Seishin is like a uh, pure and new. Uh, and what is really special is for me is this was given to me uh, by one of my heroes. <laughs> one of everybody's heroes, I think. Um, Ega Sensei. Ega Naoki Sensei. He gave me this. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was it was a pleasure to meet him, talk to him a little bit, um, especially as he was one of the people that inspired me uh, to kind of take Kendall seriously. Uh, after I managed to see him perform Kendall uh, at the World Championships when it was in the UK uh, in 2003, I'd only just started Kendall at that stage. Uh, and yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty important one. So yeah, they're my two, uh, that I've chosen. I can't pick a single favorite one. I've got too many that I love. I've got a great one that my wife gave me from her high school. Uh, I've got one from my senpai from the British team after he won the European championships. He made a commemorative 10 degree. That's another real f favorite of mine. Uh, it's just these two ones that were to hand. Okay, uh, so that's it for today. It's been a nice long video today because I had loads of questions to get through. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for them. Don't forget, join the Kendall Show Early Access group. There's a link in the description down below. Like, share, subscribe. And if you like what I'm doing, don't forget to shop at kendostar.com. Thanks a lot. See you later.